isn't it so much easier just doing audio podcasts because you could just like slouch and yeah you know chat about movies and stuff in whatever positions you're in but uh are you all ready for the the dreaded end of the year um you could say i will i am um sorry i'm just being i'm trying to because i'm just getting a brand new tablet and so i'm trying to install things like imdb or whatever onto it Um, not that that i would cheat Uh, i never cheat i do Um, (laughs) it's just to make sure that it's there i'm off to the to the left because like i said i'm using my phone i'm guessing you've got a halo effect there with the light behind us yeah i'm using my phone so it's because i've got one of those Samsung Galaxy Fold 5s. Okay. So I'm actually using the out screen rather than the in screen because the camera on the front is a 50 megapixel camera. So wow. it's a hell of a lot better than the ones that inside. So I'm trying my best not to move away from it so I don't get hit by the light behind us. Oh, it's, so, it, it is fine. I know you're not a huge fan of this time of year, same way I'm not. So we won't use the dreaded C word um too often so we'll focus on the end of the year stuff but how has uh 2023 been for you Stu miller what what are some of your highlights not so much the film highlights but just life in general it's been a weird year it's been a weird weird year um just because the fact that like so many ups and downs as usual with any year it's just been one of those kind of things where you think you know what i could just do with one of those years where absolutely nothing happens or even just a few months where nothing happens, but that's not the case. For example, I've been sick or I've had the flu six times this year, six different separate occasions. In the last three months, um, I've lost my voice twice in the last three months. One of them was last week. Yeah, and uh, what was in October where I was off sick for three weeks because I had a throat infection. Yeah. Um, so I'm waiting for bloods to come back in regards to that. So, and uh, my friend, he became a parent for the first time, uh, coming up two weeks now, two weeks tomorrow, became a parent for the first time. I found out about three weeks ago that looks like I potentially might not have a job in 2024 because the place where I work has been sold. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, they've been sold to Admiral. So I work for more than home insurance, which that's going to be no more. Yeah. Uh, so I work for them. So potentially 2024, depends on what happens then. I could be without a job for a little while. So yeah, it's been a uh, kind of year. Now, now, obviously, like being without a job, uh, being without an income is not a great thing. But sometimes being without a job, it gives you the kick up the rear end that you need, but may not take if you've still got a job. Yeah. Uh, do you do you? think that you would go back into something similar or do you think you know what i'm going to do something totally different and something more fun well the thing is the northeast is only predominantly a lot of call centers yeah that, that's the problem with the northeast there is because we are the poorest part of the uk and um, so a lot of companies um who do call center work move up to the northeast because it's cheaper do you think you, cheaper, you would do you think you would do you think you would ever maybe relocate? Is that something that you might do? I don't have the funds to. If I had the funds to, I would do it at a heartbeat, but I just really don't have the funds to. That's the problem about, again, living in the Northeast. Unless you've got somebody to back you up, which I don't. I live on my own. I'm on my own. Um, I don't have the facility to be able to actually go, you know what, I'll easily be able to take two, three months off work. In that time there, I'll be able to go, well, we'll find places to live, relocate, bloody blah, blah, look for a new job um, in somewhere in a different city. But it, it's it's hard to actually do when you live in, like I said, the poorest part of the UK. Somebody needs to give you a film review show. Seriously, I'd, I'd watch that. Yeah. That would do. So anybody, anybody, certainly if it's horror related, that would be even better. But I think just a general, so here you go, Stu, watch these now. Entertain us with your thoughts, reviews, both both uh, in praise of the film and maybe not so much praise of the film. So, yeah, come on, BBC, bring me on as the new critic for Radio 1 or something like that. <laughs> oh, I would watch slash listen to that. So, yeah. I'll be the new Mark Kermode. Definitely. How do you think it's been for movies and stuff this year overall and TV shows? Has it been a good year for content? 
TV shows, well, you know me in TV shows. I don't mix very well with TV shows, so um, I can't say very much on that front there. I've watched that Monarch um, on that little TV Plus. I'm three in. I'm enjoying it. I'm liking it so far. It's, Not bad. Yeah, it's good. It's quali- It's a quality show. Um, if you're watching something that's going to have like tons and tons of monsters in it, you know, I've seen a few monsters, but not wall to wall monsters, which I quite like that. It's it's a very adulty type talky show. But yeah. so far, I'm liking it. The thing with the program is if you can get past the first episode, because the first episode is not really a strong episode as an opener compared to, say, for example, with Rings of Power. Like the first two episodes of Rings of Power, they, they were the best thing about that, pro- that, that series because it was such a strong opener. And you yep. need to have something which has a really strong opener to it. And that one doesn't. It's a very eh kind of opener. But, yeah, I, I stuck with it just because it gave me a reason to actually use Apple TV Plus, if I'm being honest. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I got free with Playsta- uh, through PlayStation 5, but it just gave me a reason, like I said, to use that. I got a free three-month trial through Roku, so that's what I'm currently running on. So I'll use it. I do like Apple. But I'm not. I'm kind of falling out with a lot of the streamers because it's like I've got enough discs and stuff in my house that I never have to worry about running out of things to watch. So, you know, why pay money for things that a I can't afford and b I don't really use as much. So, yeah. Um, in the realm of video games, because obviously video games is uh, one of my other loves. Um, it's again, it's been a bit of an interesting weird mixed year because there's been some phenomenal video games released this year yet you have had the car crashes um the king kong um, game which got absolutely destroyed because it looks absolutely atrocious there was, Gollum. A, there was a king kong game didn't even know about that one yeah <laughs> um rise of kong um oh. it yeah you should see it after this have a watch even just a, one youtube video on it it's yeah. atrocious um, Gollum as well. Um, there was a new Walking Dead game, Walking okay. the Walking Dead Destinies, which looks, again, absolutely abhorrent. Um, you've got uh, a new open world kind of game, very similar to The Division 2, which the developers have closed down four days after they released the game. Wow, okay. That's, in theater. that's not a good sign. Yeah, because it's full of stolen assets, like um, stolen stuff from other games that they've just put into their game to make their own game. Um, You've got Redfall, which was from a studio called Arcane, which did things like Deathloop and Dishonored. Uh, So big, huge, massive games, and Redfall got absolutely destroyed because it was an absolute buggy mess. Even Starfield from Bethesda, it was probably the most basic game that they could actually release, but the most safe one. So there's been some crap, but yet you've had some really brilliant games like the Resident Evil 4 remake, um, Alan Wake 2. Alan Wake 2 is a brilliant game. Um, Stuff like that. So, yeah, video games-wise, it's been an up and down kind of year as well. Well, I enjoyed Hogwarts Legacy. I think that is the game that I've played the most hours on this year. It's 55 hours, which is, you know, for me, it's pretty good. But for for other gamers, that's pretty terrible. And I've been trying to play some of the VR games. So I've been playing Arizona Sunshine 2, which is yeah. very, very good with the VR 2. But it's been a, a lot of the VR 2 titles are just like me. They're sort of feel clunky and the controls aren't great. Creed, is, uh, which was ported over from the VR, VR 1, that's really good. So that and Arizona Sunshine 2 are my favorite um, VR games that I've played. I did play some Walking Dead Saints and Sinners. Couldn't find any weapons, so I'm just literally wandering around aimlessly, just blasting about 10 minutes. So it's VR 2, the technology is a lot better than VR 1, but it doesn't have any real wow titles. You've got to go out and buy the system because that game's amazing. So I'm waiting for those. It's very stereotypical, though, of Sony. Like, Sony concentrates on their main thing, so their console. Um, and then whatever the release alongside it, they're sort of like pushed to one side. You look yeah. at the Vita. The Vita launched uh, just before the PlayStation 4. Um, and once the PlayStation 4 came out, they were only ever interested in the PS4 and they threw the Vita to one side. This new PlayStation Portal, it's only a streaming device. You need a PS5 for it to work. Yeah. And you can only stream games off your PS5 onto it. 
well, what's the point when you can do it on your phone anyway? You can yeah, stream or, five games on your phone or tablet. Or as I discovered the other week, uh, the iPad, which I'd heard people talking about it. I'm like, I wonder if that works on my iPad. And it did. And it's a little bit fiddly to set up. But once you've done it, it's like, it's kind of cool. I suppose that's if you've got your PlayStation in the main room and somebody else utilizes your TV more than you can get onto it. Maybe there's an angle for that. But it's weird that this thing isn't like, I don't know, the the PlayStation thing's a bit odd. Yeah, a standalone thing. But yeah, the, the world of video games is, say for like Nintendo, Nintendo has released obviously Tears of the Kingdom and Mario Wonders and stuff like that. They're in a, they've had a stupidly strong year considering that they're a company that are in a transitional period because mm. the next Switch is going to be announced probably within the first three months of next year for it to have a late next year release around about October, November time is okay. when we'll see the Switch 2. Um, so they're in a transitional period, but that, they had a really strong year because Tears of the Kingdom and Super Mario Wonders uh, and Pikmin 4 are huge games. And so they've done gangbusters for Nintendo. Sony's had a pretty decent year as well with some of the games that they've released. Microsoft have just bought a ton of studios, acquired Activision, and didn't release that much. Again, Yet people are still patting them on the back for Game Pass. <laughs> they are, yeah. Game Pass, it's the future of gaming, Stu. It's the future. Apparently, who, knows when, who knows when this future is going to arrive, but apparently it's, this is it. It shows you how bad that Microsoft are doing when people think they are actually doing really well. In yeah. Spain, I know this is only Spain, but in Spain, the PlayStation Portal outsold the Xbox. Wow. So that, that says a lot. But, yeah, we'll see what 2024 brings because Microsoft have got a a decent slate of games coming out in 2024. Sony hasn't. They have pretty much got nothing. The Wolverine game, which Pooh and Somniac, they were hacked. Yeah, they were. For the next 10 years have been leaked. But, yeah, you've got the new uh, Wolverine game, but that's pretty much all has been announced so far because The Last of Us Factions has been cancelled. You've got the remaster of The Last of Us 2 out in January, but you need to look at new stuff. So we'll see what Sony brings and Nintendo, like I said, they've got the Switch 2 in in the end of the year. So, What would you hope from a Switch 2? It's going to be more powerful, uh, but it's Nintendo. Mm. Remember when the, the Switch 1 came out, it used the Tegra X1, which is the chip that was used in the NVIDIA Shield. Um, so people, it was a powerful chip at the time, but it was two years behind because NVIDIA was actually working on the Tegra 2, Tegra X2. Yeah. So we'll see. I will work with NVIDIA again because they'll definitely do that. They've got a good partnership with NVIDIA, but it needs to be stronger. And the rumors are around about PlayStation 4 kind of graphics, which I think will be perfect okay. for Nintendo. Yeah, they don't need to strive for what, say, the, um, what the Steam Deck is doing or the uh, Ally Rock or anything like that. They don't need to go for that territory because Nintendo is Nintendo. They have the games to back themselves up. Yeah, you just need as, to bring a new Mario out, a new Zelda, and you know everybody's to, happy then. Bring them out. It's fine. As with the Steam Deck and the Ally and um, them, they have, have to rely on what's on Steam, what's on PC. Uh, for it to work, and then you have to dial it down for it to actually work on that, whereas Nintendo um, will actually be able to create. For example, um, what people don't realise is that the last Mario game, so Mario on the Switch, only took 18 months to to make. So not Wonders. Yeah. The mainline Mario game on the Switch only took 18 months to actually make. And so if they can do that in 18 months, yeah. So I, I think it, it, it will be a powerful device. It will have an OLED screen. It'll hopefully be backwards compatibility. It has to be. Yeah. What do you think your most popular game for you has been this year? What one have you spent more time on than any others? Um. Well, at the moment, I'm playing that Power Wash Simulator. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a brilliant distraction of a game. <laughs> Um, it's one of those ones where you just go, I'll just clean a little bit of this area up. Because that's all it is. You've just got to clean a house or clean Santa's Grotto, for example, or something like that. Okay. And so <laughs> you just go, I'll clean this. And then an hour and a half, two hours later, you're still playing it. 
because you don't realise how much time has gone by. So I've put a lot into that as of late, just because I'm on, again, I'm slightly bored. I've got a ton of games for Christmas, but I'm slightly bored at the moment. But um, Alan Wake 2 was probably the game I loved the most this year that yeah. I played through. Because I, I did, I put a good 25, 30 hours in the Hogwarts Legacy and I finished that game. Yeah. Uh, but it was becoming really repetitive. Yeah, it was. As, yeah. Whereas with Alan Wake 2, it only had a little bit of a blip at the end where I didn't think the end was strong enough compared to the the what was before it. But yeah, Alan Wake 2 was video game wise was my game of this year. And where does it compare to the first one? I played the first one quite a lot on the 360 when when that was a thing, and I enjoyed it. It has a different feel because you play two different people. You play Alan Alan Wake and you play Saga, okay. and Saga and Alan um, are sort of like have two different ways of handling what they do. Saga's is more investigative. Um, and Alan's is more old school survival horror in a way. Yeah. Says is more puzzle orientated because you have to use a lot of light and things like that for puzzle. Um, so his is more like a Resident Evil and Saga's is more like uh, if you were doing a, and a sort of like an investigative kind of game. So like a Sherlock Holmes or something like that. Yeah. And the meld really well because they obviously have the major horror undercurrents to it. And there is a batch of crazy moment of around about three, four hours into the game, which you just don't see coming. And when it happens, you just, you, you've just got to let it happen because it's nuts, which a lot of people don't know what I, I, I'm talking about on that instance there, because it, it's been memed badly right. and it was the game awards um, so people don't know what that is, but I don't want to spoil it because it's that kind no. of experience thing. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Uh, I'll I'll have that to come at some point. And what's your plans for 2024? Obviously, you don't know what's going to go on with the work thing, so that that may, you know, send you off in one direction or the other direction. But do you set goals for the coming year or for the, or New Year's resolution type things or not? Nope, I tried it once uh, and then COVID hit. Ah. So uh, <laughs> 2020. <laughs> It was the year that I turned 40 and I tried it once where I thought, you know what, I'll do something different each month. They up to my birthday and I'll do a skydive for my birthday or, or something like that. And then COVID hit. So no so skydive. <laughs> yeah, no. When something like that happens, you just don't plan. Because if you plan, then it, it'll just not happen. So you just let things happen. So it's just the usual things like see what happens with work um go to as many gigs as i possibly can i've already got three in january wow. three gigs in the space of five days in january because you did uh, quite a few this year didn't you you were you were definitely getting back yeah. into the gigging so i'm going to see a band called, called slaughter to prevail um in the middle of january on the sunday in manchester then i travel back up to um sundland and then i'm going to see bring me the horizon of bad Women's in newcastle on the wednesday yeah. And um, I'm going to uh, see a gig uh, for Bury tomorrow, the day after, in Newcastle. And I've got Download, again, Download in June. And I'm going to see Tenacious D in May, so Jack nice. Black. Brilliant. See Tenacious D in Manchester in May, so... And then there'll be more gigs on top of that. Yeah. So you've got time to do New Year's, New Year's resolutions. You're too busy travelling here, there and everywhere, doing gigs <laughs> and watching movies, both good and bad. Uh, do you want to do your favourite movies first or do you want to do the worst movies first? I'll let you choose. Actually, I'm throwing it to your, in your direction. I what, what... will I, I will choose the worst ones because that way the, our episode can end on a high. That's me, you know. <laughs> so we'll get the worst. Usually when you used to do them on the Monday Movie Show, I was always quite happy because a lot of the time I'd never seen any of your worst films. So I always managed to avoid most of them. Now and again, you chuck one in when I'm like, that's actually on my best list. So, you know, we won't talk about that. But uh, usually I manage to avoid them. So I'm going to see how I do this year with your uh, with the worst films. So I don't do top tens anymore just because I don't have the time to actually watch as many films as I used to watch. And the fact that I don't have them on the movie show where I could watch easily 200 films in a year very easily. Mm -hmm. And so in that instance there, I would have to do a top 10 
worst and top 10 best films because I'll have seen so many and then some dishonorable mentions. So it's five worst, five best, but there are some dishonorable mentions. Okay. Um, I've cheated slightly on the dishonorable mentions with the worst because okay. I've got five and then I've got a sixth, which encompasses more than just one film. Right. Uh, okay. So I'll go through the worst dishonorable mentions. So the, the first one is Black Demon. That's in it. Yep. <laughs> it is on Paramount Plus and it is, it's been a year for shark movies. Shark movies have seen to read their ugly head again because we've had to make two of the trench. Oh, we've had, that, was, that was awful. It was awful. We had Cocaine Shark, which yeah. was obviously a, a, a Mickey take on Cocaine Bear. So you take Cocaine Bear and you do it with a shark. Um, and so Black Demon is a shark film. A shark film about a family who goes to their usual holiday home for the month and then a storm hits and brings in this shark that ends off um, sort of like they're stuck in their little holiday home and they have to try and survive. It's atrocious. Honestly, really atrocious. Not as bad, not as bad enough to get into my worst five list. Okay. But it yep. is atrocious because the acting is awful. The shark is that that's the problem with shark films. I think you can get away with it if the if it's so stupid that shark Nero sort of works because it gets away with it because it's everything about it, the CGI, the acting, et cetera, is atrocious. But yeah. when a film has got everything atrocious but tries its best to play itself serious, then you know it's awful because the Meg 2, it's just a slapstick comedy yeah. with a shark. But a bad one, yeah. Very, very bad one. Uh, this is just, it, it's funny because it's awful. Like, and I know it's, it, it's not very nice to hearken on to uh, um, directors and writers and um, VFX, uh, VFX artists and things like that because th that's their job. Uh, mm. But come on, that's <laughs> all part of the worst films list. And Black Demon, if, even if you're a fan of cheesy, terrible, terrible shark films, You'll find that to be a pile of crap as anyway. So, okay. Next up, Pet Cemetery Bloodlines. Who? Yeah, haven't seen pets? it yet. Haven't seen it yet. I say yet. I will watch it at some point. So, who would have thought that we needed a sequel to to Pet Cemetery to the remake of Pet Cemetery? Um, nobody, because we didn't need Pet Cemetery Bloodlines. It it follows a similar kind of premise as the original one, but. Nowhere near as good. The 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 remake is okay. Mm -hmm. As remake score, it's fine. It treads the same kind of ground and it gave away its big twist in the trailer. Um, this gives away pretty much everything in the trailer. And it's this is just, a, is this a sequel or a prequel? So it's a sequel to the Pet Cemetery one. It's a prequel to the right. remake. Okay. Pet right. Cemetery. Okay. It's not a sequel to the original or a sequel to Pet Cemetery Two. The original. Yep. It's a prequel to Pet Cemetery the because it's sort of like the origins of uh, the cemetery itself. Yeah, which yeah, we didn't so need to know. I don't know about you, but I didn't come away from the remake going, I really need to know more about this cemetery. I was good. It's Pet Cemetery. It's a weird one. It's fine. <laughs> I want to find out how they actually came across to making a Pet Cemetery and it brought people back. You, you don't need prequels to everything. As a matter no. of fact, prequels are one of the worst things ever because you know how it's going to end. Yep. It's going to end leading into the original film. Um, just to be awkward, if I was a director, I would start off with the prequel. Yeah. <laughs> just to be weird. I don't yeah. know how that would work because the next film is actually the sequel and I will just go, no, it's actually the original. So this is actually film zero. And then the next one is film one. So that's I think how I just when you need when you need a spreadsheet to work out where the film slots into the timeline, I think it's time to go. Do you know what? I'm good. They've done it wrong. Shout out to Marvel for that one. I've just been really awkward because I, I wonder how many people when um, when Ocean's Eleven came out went. So where's the first ten? I know I'm that's not... a true true story with Henry V when Kenneth Branagh was doing that. Some studio exec said, "How much did the first four make?" True story. Yeah. It's like really, for God's sake. So that, that's what I would do as well. I would just go, you know what? Let's make a film, but choose a random number. Yeah. Like, and it has to be a number between one and 10. It can't be a number beyond 10 because then it sort of like has, it might be a reference in the film itself. So mm -hmm. just call it so-and-so three. Yeah, just, just to be weird. 
just to make these poor sods run around on the internet trying to find the, the previous films. Yeah, and then yeah. that's a good way where you can play against those because then you can start making things up. Because when they're trying to hunt around for what happened in the first or second one, you can, in interviews, go, well, in the first one, this actually happened. <laughs> and then in the second one, this actually happened. But you know it's not true. I think you would have uh, film Twitter coming after you. <laughs> And film Perfect. face and film Facebook. To be fair, they're worse than film Twitter nowadays. Yeah, Jesus. I don't care because it'll be good way to troll the trolls. Exactly, and they deserve it. So what's what's next? No surprise, Fast X. It's better than Fast Nine. To be fair, it, it really is. That's why it's in my dishonorable mentions because Fast Nine made my worst five list. Yeah. Um. So it is slightly better, but still, it's still an atrocious film. And I like the Fast and Furious movies, but ever since seven, seven was good. Eight, nine, and ten are like I don't even know why I'm still watching them. I think I'm watching them out of pure habit now. And Vin Diesel turning around and saying he wants to make eleven into two parts. <laughs> yeah, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> it's just, it, and it didn't do as well at the box office, so that's maybe why they're gonna have to rethink it a little bit. Yeah, because uh, yeah, I think it was one of the worst takens out of the fast ones, not including the original three, because they only sort of like cottoned on after word of mouth. And when yeah, they, the fast series came out, they were small films, really, weren't they? One, two, and three. Yeah. Uh, but Jason Momoa was really good in Fast X. I've got to give the film points for him. Other than that, I couldn't. That ending, what the hell, really? Come on. He Just, got on my oh, nerves. Awful. He he really got on my nerves, Jason really? Momoa film okay. yeah so even that didn't do anything for me so yeah fast x awful film yeah. um next one is the price we pay it's yeah, just no. yeah it's a small little horror see this year i had a really bad time with horror because you know like some years horror can be uh, one of the best genres and release some fantastic films which that has been but the kind of quality of horror films that have come out this year has been awful in a lot of aspects um, price repair is just about two slack jaws who decide to hold up a petrol station. They kidnap somebody. They think they've gone off to a safe spot. Sounds familiar, this doesn't it? And then this, in this safe spot, it's actually a family of cannibals. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> it, it's it's awful. It's just really awful. It's just nothing about it is is fun or the gore is just not there. The kills is not there in a family of cannibals. There's only yep. one scene with cannibals uh, with cannibal behavior in it. It's just, what's the point? I'll skip that one. I think definitely do that. It, it, yeah, it, it was one of those. I think when I watched it, it was, it was that kind of deal where I think I watched like two or three bad films in a row. And I thought, because I saw this on Amazon, I thought, you know what? The the trailer looks okay. I'll watch the trailer. Eh, fine. I'll watch the film. Awful. And now, just to be awkward, I'm going yeah. to have to mute myself because I'm going to cough. You're going to so, cough? Okay. Yes. <laughs> so anybody who's, uh, who's making notes of these, you know which films to skip. So uh, there's a couple I'm going to skip as well. So uh, I'm now watching on video, Stu coughing his guts up. There it goes back now. <laughs> Sorry. There you go. At, least, what... you're, at least you're muted. That's, that's uh, you know, that's nice. Yeah. That's good. This is what happens when you've uh, had a really bad throat and it's just starting to come back and you start speaking um, yep. too much that your throat ends off coughing <laughs> a lot. Even though I've got a drink to the side of it, it's still not helping. So again, p- apologies if people see... A no name drink. I'll try the best to hide the can. And do you know what? YouTube don't monetize me anyway because they're horrible and mean. So it's fine. You can advertise whatever you're drinking. I have uh, I have lovely Tango Dark Berry here for for my drinks. So there you go. I have Fanta. Fanta nice. orange. Just because my local uh, heroin are actually doing uh, a lot of deals on pop, and you can get eight cans of it for one pound forty nine. That's not so. bad. Some some places you'll pay that for one can. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Especially where I work. Um, next up is a film that came out right at the start of the year, um, and it stuck with me for all the wrong reasons, despite the fact that it's got a decent Metacritic score, and it's got a decent um, IMDb star rating as well. Okay. Any guesses? 
No, but I'm hoping it's not one that's on my list. <laughs> it's, what, what is it? Don't... It came out near to the start of the year. I think in this country, I'm just trying to find out the exact date when it came out. You're not it... going for Cocaine Bear, are you? No, Cocaine no. Bear's an awful film anyway. That's an uh, awesome it... film. <laughs> it's an awful film. It came out in January, this film, in the UK, okay. January 20th. Go on, what was it? Babylon. See, I started watching it, and I, I've only seen 25 minutes of it, and I think, I no idea what the hell's going on, but I just love the chaos of that film. So I do need to go back and actually watch that just to just to see, but I couldn't tell you what the hell was going on. It just looked like, I don't know, insanity, to be fair. It pretty much sums up the film itself. It's just debauchery set in the 1920s and 30s where filmmaking was actually uh, cottoning on and it was the advent of going from black and white to colour. Yeah. And th- that, that's it. It's a headache of a film. <laughs> Literally, it, it ca- honestly, it is. it causes you an absolute headache. And I could not see where the critics, some of the critics were actually loading praise over it and how people were actually giving it, like, Eights, nines, and tens. I know IMDb star ratings is absolutely nothing. You just don't believe yeah. them at all. Uh, but my God, is that movie a headache of a film? I had to take a couple, a couple of paracetamols at the end of it. I think some of it's because it's Damien Chazelle, isn't it? Yeah. And I think a lot of people go, "Oh, he's done a film. That must be great. We need to just jump on the bandwagon and go. Oh, how amazing is that one? Even though they don't maybe seek, well, on, don't like it, they've kind of feel the need to say they liked it. So maybe it's some of that, but. But uh, yeah. I, I liked what I saw. I'm just not going to say, oh, yes, I understood what was going on. It just looked like insanity and chaos and debauchery. So I'm all for exactly, that sometimes. But it's, it's, it does sound like an absolute hoot to be, to be that. But it's all for close to two and a half hours. And it's yeah. like that for two and a half hours. <laughs> two and a half agonizing hours. Um, one thing I will note as well is that I had not seen, there's a couple of films, especially big films I've not seen before yeah. like the best of uh, films here list. So things like uh, Oppenheimer, still not being able to really? see. Really? Okay. Yep. Um, Killers of the Flower Moon. I watched, still not able to see. I, watched, I watched that one this week. I enjoyed it. So it feels its length, but it's good. Just because that that, that is the problem I have. Um, yeah. I haven't got a, yeah, I might have enough time to watch one film, which is like 90 minutes. Uh, and I know over the weekend I watched six films. Um, but it's just like, should I watch three films? I'll watch one film that's like three and a half hours yeah. long. I know that feeling. I've, I've spent the past month trying to schedule in Killers of the Flower Moon because it's not the sort of film you put on at half eight at night. Certainly when you get back from work, you go, oh, I'm going to watch a film. You ain't watching three and a half hours of Killers of the Flower Moon. You'll be asleep. Yeah, so the, I, I'm not saying when it comes to the best of your list because I know on a lot of critics' lists, there is Killers of the Flower Moon. There is Oppenheimer. Just not being able to have the time to actually watch it. Plus in the fact that when Oppenheimer and Barbie came out, my cinema closed down. Oh, so, okay. So, yeah, because as I said on a previous show, the closest cinema to me now was a good 45, 50 minute bus ride. Yeah. They're, they all are actually talking about reopening the cinema because the Empire film chain went into administration. And there is um, an Irish chain of uh, cinemas called Omniplex, which has mm-hmm. actually took over a lot of the Empire cinemas across the country. And so, the local council in Sunderland are actually talking to four big chains to actually open the place up as a cinema. They won't have to do a lot to it because it is a cinema anyway, so they'll just have to yeah. put their, their slant on it. So hopefully have a cinema open up in 2024. Let so you run back. it. Let you run it. Go work at cinema. You could you could be the uh, the scheduler or something. At Stu Miller Fest. That would be a thing. Schedule Will horror movies. Trust? Will they trust me? Probably yeah. not. Well, they should. <laughs> Maybe you know, at least for the first year, maybe not for the second, but yeah. Go. So yeah, what else you got? Well, let's. And then one last dishonorable mention, and as I said, it's a genre. It's the superhero movie genre. Yeah. Because this year, bar one, for, well, bar two, because if you look at um, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse, mm-hmm. I won't classify Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as a superhero. What film, but if you look at Spider Man into the Spider Verse and Guardians of the Galaxy 3, Volume 3, those are the slight two outliners because the rest I've not seen Aquaman, which has been getting an absolute kicking from the reviews. 
course it will, because Amber Heard's in it. It's the the attack dogs are out for it. It's a DC film. Amber Heard's in it. They're like, let's get it. It's that's yeah. yeah it's uh, not that a lot of the reviews I've been looking at have been actually thrown at Jason Momoa more so. Really, really bad performance and how bad the story is and pretty much everything in the film. So uh, that's out in cinemas tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, Aquaman. So I've not seen that, and I've not seen Blue Beetle. I've, I've I've seen that and I got a bit bored with it because I'm like I don't need there's a sequence in it when he gets his suit and it just seems like he flies around playing with his suit for like 20 minutes it's like I've seen this in every other superhero when somebody gets their powers and they, they run up and, down, and I'm like I'm kind of bored so I ended up watching something that I'd seen like 30 years ago instead but um, it, yeah it's a superhero movie so it's mainly the Marvels Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania and Shazam Fury of the Gods yeah, all three bored the hell out of us. They're they're just really bad films. So yeah, superhero films have had a, a really bad time this year, which I don't know how they're gonna recover because they just have been a massive downward spiral for a couple of years now. Make so, le- make less films, Disney. Stop making TV shows of superheroes and do two films a year instead of trying to spit them out like bullets and concentrate on the ones you make, make them better. Yeah. So eight of the five, because I know we're starting to become slightly constrained of time. So mm-hmm. um, number five, and these are actually in proper order now. Number five is the 2023 remake of Children of the Corn. God, yeah, I've not seen that one. Yep. And it's awful. It's really, <laughs> really awful. It, it's um, So the Children of the Corn franchise, bar the original Children of the Corn film, uh, progressively got worse and worse. It's sort of like yeah. the Rock Turn franchise. Like progressively got worse. Well, the second one's quite fun. Mm-hmm. Um, third one from there, and then got worse. This is just wh- why remake it. The remake didn't bring anything at all to the the table. It's just awful. Number four is a film called Swim. That's which is I'm doing well. Yep. Two sisters. Um, one of them gets trapped under a, bo- a boulder after they're doing some deep diving, and it's up to the other sister to try and rescue her. Honestly, they are the thickest people I've seen in a film <laughs> this year. Like, you know, when you watch a, uh, a horror film or something like that, and you think, why did you make that decision? Why did you go into that room when you know the killer's in there? Or why did you do that? They make every single one of those stupid decisions. Like, literally, they are the thickest people. Like, there is a scene where the sister, she goes to this, she sees this sort of, like, abandoned house, and she knocks on the door, no answer. So instead of trying to break down the door, she decides to break through the window and then opens the door. And it's okay. those kind of decisions <laughs> which make what? Well, because she's trying to also get into um, the boot of a, the car to try and find so uh, like an oxygen tank. And she just sticks a knife into the lock, turns it around slightly and the blade snaps, and then she gives in. And her idea to try and get into the car is to push the car off a cliff. That works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I I usually like these films where somebody's stuck in a stuck on a rock, stuck on an island, like the shallows or all these sort of stuff. But yeah, the the stupid decisions puts me off a little bit. So yeah, number four is uh, swim. Number three, you'll have heard of this one, Expendables Four. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, sake. I it didn't make any of my list. I didn't mind it because it was just stupid, dumb, explosive shit basically. So I enjoyed it for what it was. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's the Expendable series is, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with that one. It's just, my God. I know, yeah. As you said, you don't mind some dumb action fun, but th- there's nothing in this film that's fun. Everything about the movie is god-awful. It's like yeah. really god-awful. So please stop. Just don't make any more. Yeah, yeah, stop. Or give it a budget. Or, or a decent uh, visual effects would be nice. Stop. Just <laughs> yeah, stop. stop. Um, yep. Number two, this might surprise you because you might think that this is going to be my number one, and it's a joint number two. It's Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, and Three Blind Mice. Yeah, Three Blind Mice I've not seen. Winnie the Pooh, Blood and, Mon- Blood and Honey. I, I, as a Winnie the Pooh film, it's terrible. As a slasher film, I've seen worse. I'm sure you have, but it's just, it's a weird, it's an odd one. It's Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, isn't it? There was a third one, wasn't there? Because there was Winnie the Pooh. Blood yeah, Mary, the... Mary had a little lamb. Mary had a little lamb. I've not seen Mary had a little lamb yet. Um, I've only seen the trailer for it, but it has exactly the same actors and actresses that are in yeah. Three Black Mice. Yep. 
like the way three blind mice ends, which does not have an ending, <laughs> that same actress who survives at the end of three blind mice, she plays exactly the same character in Mary Had a Little Lamb. Oh, okay. So yeah, the, the, you would have thought that there would have been number one, but my God, there is a film that is number one that I can't believe I watched it. And it is one of the worst films I've seen in a good last 10 years. Oh, wow. Okay. It's a, you'll have not seen it or heard of it. It's a film called Gangnam Zombie. No, oh, Jesus Christ. No. I am, and, why, why would somebody think that title's a good idea to make into a film? Because it's not about Gangnam style. It's okay. actually, there is a place in Thailand called Gangnam. That's where Gangnam oh, style comes from. They missed a and trick there, didn't they? Yeah, there's a place called Gangnam, um, Gangnam in Thailand. It's a zombie film where the first zombie only shows up around about 50 minutes into the film, 50, 55 minutes into the film itself. Okay. It has the worst makeup effect I've seen in a very long time. It has some of the worst acting I've seen in pretty in a very, very long time. And you watch it, Blood and Honey. <laughs> so, yes. you know, whoa. Yeah. The costume design in Blood and Honey is a million times better than Gangnam Zombie. Oh, that's, yeah. And the, the costume design in Blood and Honey wasn't great. The performances it, were fine, but the costumes were not amazing at all. At least they used a tiny little bit of budget on the mask for, for Winnie the Pooh. They just did not have any budget with this. No. It, it, it's, no, it, it's like the, the, per, the director got a dairy which they do get envelopes, red envelopes with some money in it for their new year. It's like they, he got that, he got like 50 quid and thought, oh, let's make a film. And that's not to say you can't make a film of 50 quid, look at Colin. Yeah. They made a zombie film for 45 pounds. Yeah. Uh, but that was like 10 years ago. This is now. <laughs> so my worst film of 2023, Gangnam Zombie. I'm gonna I'm gonna slightly defend Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. There's one scene in that which I genuinely really enjoyed, and it's when uh, she's in the hot tub and she's and doing the thing with her phone, and the camera keeps going off, and the flash lights the Winnie the Pooh up as he gets closer and closer. That made me smile. I did enjoy that scene, but you know, no, awful, no, awful. Gangnam Zombie is the worst film I've seen in 2023. So everybody skip that one. So let, let's shift it on to more positive. What have you got for the better films? So obviously some honourable mentions, I'm guessing, and then your top five. What have you got? So, honourable mentions, Evil Dead Rise. Oh. I really love Evil Dead Rise. I love that film. Yeah, because it just had no expectations in it. Because I watched the trailer. The trailer was brilliant. But it was still the expectations were just going, ah, oh, it's going to be another Evil Dead film. And... The director got it so right, Lee Cronin. Yeah. He got it so right. Like, it had to feel it. It, it had the slight humour, but not like the silly humour of Evil Dead 2. Um, it had more like the humour of Evil Dead. And that opening sequence, that opening sequence where you just have the name Evil Dead rise yeah. up is just... I love that kind of stuff. I but had... I had no idea what to expect with Evil Dead Rides because I, so I came to bed early one night and I was downstairs watching some talent show or something and thought, I want to watch something that's like 90 minutes. Let's put one of them on. And I put Evil Dead Rise on and that opening scene, it's like, what the hell am I about to watch? Uh, I, yeah, I loved it. And then I made her sit down and watch it a few days later. But really, it's really on, good. It's on Netflix now, so I watch it on Netflix. And um, the, the only slight disappointment because... Yeah, the CGI gets a tiny bit dodgy near to the end of the film. Like, it, it is a bit too glossy. But the only annoyance for me is the cheese grater scene could have been a lot worse. Because when I heard about the cheese grater scene and saw the cheese grater scene, I was thinking, yeah, that's not bad, considering what we've seen in previous Evil Dead films, even in the Fede Alvarez Evil Dead one, where she cuts off her arm using her... Uh, a turkey cutter or just things like that, the nasty stuff like that, the visceral nature of it, cutting into our face with glass, et cetera. Yep. Um, so you're expecting a lot worse with the cheese grater scene, born against the leg and slide down. Not as bad as people make it out to be, but that's my that's a little gripe. Mm. It's not a bad gripe because the trailer made it look like, oh my God, that scene is going to be horrific. And then the scene in the film isn't any worse than really what you see in the trailer. So, Yeah. Um, another honourable mention. This might surprise you. This honourable mention, John Wick Chapter Four. 
I, I'm not confirming, but you might be knocking titles off my list here and, and reciting my top 10 list of the films. But John Wick 4, yeah. amazing. It Love surprised it. me because I'm not a fan of the series. Oh, <laughs> really? wow. Okay. Series. Why, why, why 4 and not the other ones then? Because it felt like I was watching the English remake of The Raid. Like, it did actually feel like The Raid, because the, the the choreographic nature of the fight sequences in this one was the best it's been in any of, this, any of the series. Like, uh, the humour was there as well. I think that's what was needed, because there was always that undercurrent of it. Yeah. But the humour was there because of a certain couple of characters. But even just, like, the last part of the film, the last 20 minutes, his fight sequence up <laughs> those steps. <laughs> and then da, 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 it's like, oh no. Yeah. It's so, it's painful to watch, but you feel it. Mm. And whereas in the previous John Wick films, you don't feel the crunch there. Um and so I just thought, yeah, it's it's a really good film. As an act as a person who's not a huge fan of action films. It must have done something for me if it's included in my honourable mentions. And nearly three hours, which you'd think you'd get bored because there's only so much action you could see before your brain's like, I've kind of seen it all now. But that just mixed it up constantly throughout the entire film. It was brilliant. It's because of how the fight sequences are actually fleshed out. Instead of it just being bam, 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 it's given a bit of time for it to breathe. Like, yeah. there is room with inside each fight, fight with sequence. That's why it's very similar to the raid. Yes, the raid has a bam, bam, bam kind of nature, but the fight sequences, when they happen, they've given those time to actually clear out properly and breathe. Yeah. And so that's how John Wick Chapter 4 deserves it. Um, another one, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Meet Mayhem. It, yep, it's one of those films I, I never expected it to actually be good, considering the previous Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles films. Yes, it's animated, but... I'm a sucker for unique animation styles in films, and this has a brilliant, unique animation style. And it's just so fun. It reminded me of watching the the cartoons back when I was a kid. Yep. And when that does that, I love the Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles as a kid. So, yeah, definitely recommend. Um, okay. Next mention, When Evil Lurks. I've got that. I've not yet watched it. It's been brilliant. recommended. Yeah. Considering The Exorcist Believer came out this year, which was a big pile of dog poop, um, <laughs> really bad film. Um, this is the best uh, possession film. It's a very intelligent possession film. Like it, it, a possession movie shouldn't all be about expletives and gore. It needs to be about tension. You need to actually believe that the people who are possessed are actually possessed. And in this case here, when it's a whole town that is could be possessed. Um, it works so brilliant. It's very reminiscent of films like Pontypool, yeah. movies like that. Um, so highly recommend When Evil Looks because it has that creepy mm -hmm. undercurrent feel to it. And then last mentioned, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Yeah, which uh, Annette, Annette actually predicted that that would be your favourite film of the entire year. So Nope. Yeah. Um, the, my favourite film of the entire year is a bit of a cop-out, but I don't care. Um, <laughs> Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, again, brilliant animation. It has a lot of heart for somebody, again, who's not a superhero fan. Um, when you bring heart like that, it's very reminiscent of, because I've not played any of the Spider-Man games. I've watched okay. them being played. Yeah. Um, and they, they have that sort of like, they are those kind of games where you can definitely watch them. Mm. rather than just uh, live through them or play them because it just has that brilliant storytelling element to them and, and things like that. And that's what the animated Spider-Man films have had. Um, I'm so, sort of glad they've delayed the last part to 2025. Yeah, why? It's just down to um, so they can polish it up. No, I mean, and... why, why are you glad that they've delayed it? Are you glad they've delayed it so they can polish it up or...? Yeah. Exactly. The, right. the, you don't need to have this one released this year and then the next one released next year. You don't need to do that all the time. Like the Scream films, I know the next one is on hiatus now because of... <laughs> yeah, a little bit, yeah. But you, you don't need to do that. Yeah, there's going to be a Saw 11, unfortunately, out in October, which Saw X was actually not too bad. Um, but yeah, give it time to actually breathe a little bit. And so instead of releasing yeah. one year and then next year... And give it the 18 months and it'll actually work out better for it. Okay. So enter the top five. Good set of films there. They're good honorable mentions. So I'm looking forward to the actual five, the official 
Stu Miller's favourite films of 2023. So number five, talk to me. Again, not seen it. It's on my list to watch. I've heard a lot of good things about this one. Yeah, so it's from the Raka Raka people. Um, if you're on YouTube, they make sort of like very slapstick horror comedy kind of stuff on YouTube. And this was their directorial debut when it came to a feature length film. They're doing the new Mortal Kombat movie. Not with it, the new Street Fighter film. So they're uh-huh. doing the new Street Fighter film. Um, and so Talk to Me is just like, it's one of those rare cases where it takes tropes that we've seen before, but ha- as their own twist. So having a hand that is sort of like possessing people and mm-hmm. being able to actually see dead people is sort of like we've seen the dead people thing done before. You yeah. might, might not have seen it done with a hand, but it's just the way it handles itself. And it's one of those rare horror films where it sets out rules and it actually follows its rules. Yeah. Um, so they know that they establish a rule that you only need to be in contact with the hand for no more than 85 seconds. Beyond that, something bad will happen. And when they do push that beyond there, there's reasons behind why they have to do that, rather than just going, oh, I want to experience it, see what happens if I'm in there for 10 minutes, rather yep. than the time frame I'm given. So that when, when they do have to go beyond that, there are excuses behind it. And the horror works really well, and it's a group of people that you sort of like care about as well. Rather than there are a couple of moments in the film where there are a few questionable sort of like exchanges of dialogues and things like that, but you forgive it because of how well the rest of the film flows. And so, yeah, talk to me, definitely worth watch. And it's an Australian film, isn't it? If I believe rightly enough, Good. from the rack of people. But oh. yeah, I, I highly re- recommend um, recommend that. Um, number four, Pearl. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I yep. loved X. Um, I can't wait for Maxine. When it is t- that? Is that 2024? 2024, no date for us. Very similar to what happened with Pearl. Pearl yeah. just just dropped out of nowhere because it just did not have a distributor here in the UK. So, uh, But yeah, 2024 for us. But Mia Goth, she, she is a brilliant actress. She is a phenomenal actress, Mia Goth. Um, even when she's in stuff that the film itself is not very good, she still gives it at all. And yeah. she's front and centre of Pearl, um, in Pearl. She has to be. She's pretty, in pretty much every scene. She plays an absolute blind day. She deserves a hell of a lot more recognition that she, than she does actually get. The scene, her... There's a specific scene in the film where she's sitting at a dinner table talking to another character, and it's yeah. quite a lengthy scene. It's like that just, you know... Amazing. That that's a phenomenal, that's... phenomenal scene. Yeah, it is. So um, it, it's very similar to, did you see the film A Ghost Story? I did not. know. saw the trailer, but so I know which film it is, but no, I've not seen that one. Yeah, so that that's from the, the guy who directed Pete's Dragon and Bumblebee. Okay. Uh, and so th- there is a scene in A Ghost Story where she's eating a pie for about 10 minutes. <laughs> that's, uh, that's it. There's just a scene where she's eating a pie for 10 minutes. And that scene with Mia Goth's character in Pearl, where she is at the table, reminded me of that scene in A Ghost Story. And I love that scene in A Ghost Story. Because if you you don't always need context behind everything, but yep. the peer off is always there. Just her performance, her face, because the camera's pretty much on her face all the time in that scene. It's just outstanding. Good choice. Yeah, I'm writing these down as well, because I know Annette will ask me afterwards, what's his five? So I'm writing them down. Yeah. Um, number three, film called Past Lives. Yeah, I know it. Not seen it. Selena Song's film. It's just about the relationship between, well, two 12 year old um, uh, kids in uh, Malaysia who sort of like were friends. And then one of them, played by Greta Lee, she moves to America and he stays, uh, Teo Yao's character, he stays in Malaysia. And sort of like the start of a relationship over what their version of Skype is um, until she decides to break it off and says that she wants to, um, well, she wants to take time away, no specific amount of time, but she wants to take time away from from their relationship over that. And obviously he's heartbroken because they were childhood sweethearts. And she ends off meeting a character uh, played by um, John Magano, 
um, at this sort of like artist retreat in the Amari. And then the film fast forwards 12 years later when he actually shows up again, Tario's character, and he's just visiting America and just sort of like recoup what their friendship was. And that's it. Okay. And um, it is one of those films where you don't realise you're pretty much at the end of the film. Like it, it, uh, when I checked the time, because um, I only watched it today, so it's only made it into my top 10 today. When I checked the time, because the film's on for about an hour and 40 minutes to see how far I was into the film. I was like an hour and 15 minutes into the film and thought I was only like 20 minutes into the film. I love it when that happens for the film, when it doesn't feel it's running time. It's just such a right. simple film. Like it, it, there is no um, negativity with the movie, none whatsoever. There's no fights. There's no nudity. There's no swearing. There's none of that at all. It's just a very simple sort of like film, which is centered around three characters. And that, that's it. With some a beautiful score, um, some phenomenal direction. The camera is allowed to just be there in the scene. So highly recommend Past Lives. Okay. Yep. Uh, no, number two, Nimona. I don't know that one. It's an animated film on Netflix. There we go. It's animated. That explains it. Yep. It's outstanding. It's an outstanding film because it's one of those, it was one of those films that was on like the blacklist. Like yeah. um, it didn't have a distributor and nobody would actually pick it up. And then Netflix just went, oh, let, let's just, will distribute it, will show it on Netflix. It's outstanding. Absolutely outstanding because it has heart by a plenty. There is one scene because I was at, um, having a conversation with a colleague at work who already seen the mourner as well. And there's one scene where I was explaining it without giving it away to the rest of the people around work where it takes out the colour from the scene itself. And I love it when movies do that, especially in animation, where it just zaps out the colour. So you're just left with a monochromatic feel. And it goes silent as well. And it's just beautifully played out. And just the whole film, it has humour plenty. It has absolutely amazing character development in it. It's not afraid to actually explore taboos that other films just won't. Like, for example, um, the main hero in the film is gay. Okay. When have we seen that in a, a modern-day animated film? Like, the hero is never as always out there to go for the heroine. And that's yeah. it. It's always the way it plays out. Um, but in this case here, the hero is gay, and he gets split off from his partner, where he meets the character of Nimona, who has is not what she might seem. She's different in a very unusual but brilliant way. And there are scenes in the film, and a lot of people hate the movie Tank Girl. I quite like Tank Girl. Yeah, it's, I have yeah. soft spot for Tank Girl it's, because uh, it's. It's madness. Just weird. It's madness. Yep. But there are scenes in the film which reminded me of Tank Girl. Like when Nimona actually is being Nimona, she reminded me of Laurie Petty's character in Tank Girl. Yeah. And it just it brought a smile to me face when I was seeing scenes like that. And then, like I said, you have those tender moments in the movie. It's outstanding. It's on Netflix. I haven't seen Tank Girl for years. I might have to revisit that next year. Yeah, it's, 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 fun, it's fun movie. It's a silly film. But yep. yeah, it, it's on Netflix and I highly, highly recommend the morning. And my number one film, this is a cop out. Okay. But I don't care because I broke a rule last year. So what is my rule when it comes to me doing my your, best and worst? Your rule is it's got to be, if I remember early enough, it's got to be in the cinema or what released between whatever date, and there's a cut-off date. I know there's a cut-off date that happens. I can't remember what the cut-off date is because I asked you late last week or whatever. That rule? Yeah, so that rule indeed. So yeah. I watched a film in 2022, and I put it in my list of 20 uh, films of 2022 list, and the film itself didn't have an official UK release until March of 2023. Okay. So this is how I was able to cheat. Yeah, it's fine. I, I have one in my list of this year, which is also... I saw it at the tail end of 2022, but it was, wasn't was released in the UK until 2023. So I'm okay with that cheat. So my number one film is Marcel the Shell with Shoes on. Yeah, see, I saw that. I was looking at some lists of best films and I saw that and I'm thinking, I'm sure Stu watched that absolutely ages ago because you were always recommending that when we would podcast. 
Yeah. And that really uh, what, didn't come out here till March. Yeah, it didn't come out officially here until March in 2023. Because um, wow. I watched it on Sunday. Uh, but it, 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 official release was March. I adore Marcel the Shell with shoes on. I absolutely, I've harked on it so many times. I yep. implore everybody, if you want to feel so, like, if you want that warm hug of a movie, if you just want to be cheered up by something, if you want your heartstrings tugged by something, just whatever mood you're in, if you're looking for a film that is to suit the mood that you're in, or if you're having one of those really bad days and you want to be cheered up, Marcel, within, like, five minutes, will just make you smile. And then the parts of the film which will just make you tear up like a little baby. Now, which just... film? So two films are having a fight, Marcel and Paddington 2. Which one wins? Marcel. Really? I love wow. Paddington 2, um, I, Paddington 2 is, is a brilliant film. It's sort of like a comfort movie. But Marcel with Shell with Shoes on is that comfort film, but it's also that movie that will tug at your heartstrings and stuff like that as well. Um, but I, yeah, I implore people to see Marcel the Shell with Shoes on. Yeah, I know the, the Boy with the Heron is not in my list because it's not officially in the UK until the 26th of December. I've not yet seen it. Um, it's a Studio Ghibli film, so probably would have made my list anyway. Um, and so I, I've not seen that, but I always thought like the way I feel about Marcel the Shell with Shoes on is how I feel about Studio Ghibli films. Yeah. That I, yeah. And um, My Life is a Courgette. Which definitely again watch that film it's only on for 60 minutes so watch that film but there's no excuse it's like years you've been telling me to watch that one i've still not seen it yet so i will i will definitely put that on my 2024 list it was originally on amazon i don't know if it still was is it? on amazon. yeah but mark right. please please marcel the show with shoes on is on sky yeah so if you've got no tv or if you've got any kind of Sky, like Sky movies, it, it's on Sky. Watch Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. It's a phenomenal sort of like mockumentary film. Can't recommend it enough. That's like a really cool mix of films. You've got horror films in there and you've got like nice, sweet animated ones and films with people talking. And then obviously Pearl, which is like a mix of everything. So that's a good yeah. little mix of, of films. Production. John Wick. Mm. Yes, exactly. Which is just fucking amazing. It's John Wick Chapter 4. Yep. So it was uh, pretty good. So have you got any um, viewing habit things that you're going to do next year or are you just going to carry on, just watch whatever the hell you want to watch? Just probably carry on and do whatever what I'm doing now. Just watch whatever I want to watch, whatever takes me fancy. Obviously, tops of the list will be animated films and horror films. So, And then I'll just watch whatever else catches me fancy around that. Try my best again to watch films that very few people have watched or seen or heard of. That's always me goal. I, I do like, because that, that, that's sort of like the way I look at it, what makes my lists different. Like, I, I know that some um, critics' lists and stuff out there will have things like Spider Man Across the Spider Verse in there. And hopefully, th um, I know Past Lives is going to be featured on a hell of a lot of people's lists. Yeah. Um, even Marcel the Shell with shoes on, but I, I like to think the where I structure my lists as well as probably nobody's going to have a similar top five to mine. Well, that's what makes it interesting, though, because there's at least one film that anybody's going to listen to on your top five going, I don't even know what that film is. I'll go check it out. So hopefully they discover a gem. Maybe avoid the worst list. Yeah. You know, that might be good. Although I'm tempted to watch Swim because I quite like that sort of film, but at least I know that it's not going to be great. So, it's on Amazon. If you want to watch it, it's on Amazon Prime. I may well do. So, what have you got planned between now and the rest of the year? Then, just... um, work tomorrow, work on Saturday, and then I've got four days off. I'm off Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, Boxing Day, and the day after, and then work for another two days, and then I'm off New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, and then back to work, and then work for another couple of weeks, and then off for a week. Um, I'm going to a friend's for Christmas, dear. Mm -hmm. So uh, just pretty much chill, play loads of video games because I've got a lot of video games sitting there waiting to be played. Yep. And Christmas hopefully be able to get out and see uh, the boy in the heron. Christmas Day should be watch movies and eat food and fall asleep at whenever, like half seven at night or whatever. That's pretty much my idea of Christmas. It's just and ignore all the silliness. Just, yeah. yeah. Can't be bothered with it. No, actually, can't. Yeah, as you said, once you get to a certain age, Christmas is just a, an excuse, as you said, to eat tons of food, 
not even think about regretting eating those tons of food and then just act like a kid in the fact that you want to play video games or watch films and you don't have the parent to stop you from doing it. No, yep. you've got to sit with your family or no, you've got to open this present at this time or no, you've got to give granny a hug or you've got to take part in party games and things like that or watch the Queen's speech after Top of the Pops. Yep. You don't have to do that. You just eat lots of food, maybe watch a film, play a bit of video games, watch Doctor Who, and mm. then that's pretty much and it. Then, and then feel sick and think, I've eaten too much, never again, and then do the same old thing the year after. Yep, or in my case, do it Boxing Day, because with me being uh, going to a friend's on uh, Christmas Day, I'll be having my own little Sunday Christmas dinner on Boxing Day. Brilliant. So cook, it, cook it my own way. Sounds in your air fryer. <laughs> no, um, I because I, I do know how to cook. Air fryers are your best friends, but I do know how to cook, so I'll be doing triple cooked um, goose fat roast potatoes and honey glazed parsnips and carrots and very slow cooked roast beef. Well, do Things. that anno- do that annoying thing for me and take a picture of it and send me a picture of you once your meal's ready. Not once you've eaten it, because that's just an empty plate, isn't it? But do I want to see what a Stu Miller meal looks like? So yeah, snap, the tri- snap a bit. The triple cook roast potatoes, they'll be starting to, well, I'll start to prepare them on Saturday. Wow. Because the longer you leave them in the fridge, yeah. the more fragile the outside becomes and the more like glass they'll become when you actually cook them. And so when you cut into them, the insides are soft and fluffy and the outside is very crispy. So I'm getting hungry now, so I'm probably going to go and grab some food <laughs> before I start chatting with John Fouts in a minute. But thanks for taking time out to do these podcasts. I do enjoy them. I think it's fun. I know you enjoy them because you message me now and again going, when are you recording next? Yeah. Um, so I'm doing, I've, this is the end of year one for me and you. Uh, I'm doing the end of year one with John Fouts in a few minutes. There is no Rob one. He doesn't seem very interested in doing a podcast in a minute. So, you know, eh. so this is my second last one of the year. And then I'm going to take like a week off and then. You know, put a, new you cal- put a new calendar up. Was the one that you did with Fraser not the end of your one? Because I'm guessing all he talked about was Doctor Who. Pretty much. He does like to bang on about Doctor Who and Ghostbusters. <laughs> but a little yeah. bit. But I'm all right with that. But it, yeah, it's like Fraser, seriously, there are other shows. So um, the- he, <laughs> he, do, he does love Doctor Who. So yeah, yeah. Be, I'm doing a whole bunch of end of year episodes. Uh, and then I'm just going to. I'm just going to watch whatever the hell I want next year. I'm going to watch all my old favourite films and stuff again. And um, I'm hoping I see the emergence of the Stu Miller podcast that you've often talked about. I'm hoping yeah. that may pop up at some point in 2024. We'll see. But before 2024 starts, watch Marcel the Shell with shoes on. And I am expecting a message going, you were right. And then yep. in 2024, maybe January 1st or 2nd, Tank Girl. Good right. actually in the new year. I might make that my first film of 2024. Yep. All right. Well, you enjoy, Stu, and uh, have, have a good bunch of next days and and whatnot. And uh, I will chat to you in the new year on a podcast, but we'll chat, obviously, on Twitter and stuff between now and then. Definitely. See you in 2024. Right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.